All right, let's go ahead and get started. Oh, yes, go ahead. Thank you. That was an announcement I need to make. Um, so right now we are finishing. Uh, most of you should have already gotten feedback. Not everyone has uh, on your hypothesis. Uh, the it's not reflected on the course calendar. I but I've posted the assignment on CoLab, and the due date is uh, Tuesday. And so the hope is that the remainder of you will get your feedback by the end of the day today, and you'll be submitting your first draft of your figure illustration or graphical abstract by Tuesday. Are there any other questions? Yes. What kind of expectations for figures are there? Uh, so uh, on, on CoLab and on the syllabus, I've, I've, just, I've tried to uh, lay out the expectations. The expectations are that you, have, you provide and submit a figure illustration that communicates uh, the problem and what your hypothesized solution for either the therapy or mechanism is. Uh, sometimes perhaps the abstract can on, might only communicate the problem or it might only communicate the solution, but oftentimes the best ones are able to integrate both into the, uh, into the single graphical abstract. Are there any other questions? All right, uh, with that being said, we'll go ahead and get started. So up to this point, we have talked a lot about proteins and amino acids, their localization the, within the plasma membrane. Uh, we've talked about them as G proteins, second messenger, G proteins are sec and their effect because of second messengers. The pre-lecture talked about purification of proteins and today's lecture, we're going to talk about how do we actually analyze and measure them. And one of the ways that we'll be doing that is use, looking at uh, using the backdrop of uh, pregnancy tests, anthrax tests, and actually COVID-19 rapid antigen tests, uh, because those are unique tools that leverage uh, a, specific, uh, a specific tool that measures and analyzes proteins. There is, forgive me. Uh, there's an alum that uh, was inspired by this lecture uh, and created this illustration that talks about studying for this material and learning that pregnancy tests and anthrax tests use the same mechanism, which often leads to taking the test and not getting, not getting a sense of, do you have anthrax or you're pregnant or perhaps you have both and not being able to tell. Uh, thankfully, the tests are actually more accurate than that, uh, but, uh, but I thought you guys would get kicked out of it. Perhaps not. Uh, so pregnancy tests, anthrax tests, and uh, more recent uh, COVID-19 rapid antigen tests all use the same thing. It's called lateral flow immunochromatography. And there's some, there's, some pretty, there's some pretty good videos that help try and illustrate and walk you through what this looks like. But largely, it's a really unique tool that helps you detect and measure a specific protein on the, on the order of minutes as I'm sure all of us have probably taken rapid antigen tests at this point are intimately familiar with. Um, but it's a, really, it's a really helpful tool that leverages antibodies and uh, uh, lateral flow technology to try and detect and measure specific proteins. Uh, and so one of the more common tools that we use to measure proteins in the lab is leveraging a technique called electrophoresis. Uh, based on the name and breaking it down, does anyone want to venture a guess what electrophoresis means? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so phoresis is the Latin for like movement. And so uh, that, that was exactly right. So it's leveraging uh, a charge uh, to move proteins or move particles through this system. And so in this case, we're gonna be talking largely about uh, proteins being measured and detected using electrophoresis. Uh, 
And so we're separating these, these proteins based on their charge and their size. So we've talked about before how proteins have different sizes, uh, and that's based on both their molecular weight and their folding. Um, different proteins have different degrees of folding. And so if you can imagine, uh, as Miranda was describing, the, uh, this, this matrix that the proteins are trying to move through, their degree of folding will dictate like how much they're able to move through. And so the way this typically works is there is a positive charge applied to the bottom of the gel. And it's usually on the order of 100 to 200 volts. And the proteins are drawn through that gel. Now, if you can imagine, uh, typically for a current, it's a flow of electrons. So negative moving to positive, moving to the positive end on the bottom of the gel. Uh, you know, you, we described before how proteins generally have a positive charge. Uh, it, it's a, a broad categorization, but that's typically how we like to think of them. So we have to modify them for that to, for that to be able to work. Uh, but not only that, we're working with two different factors here with size and charge and size also has two different variables in it with molecular weight and degree of folding. And so we have to try and address each of those factors to be able to measure and detect these proteins. And so typically what happens is uh, when we're doing gel electrophoresis and uh, I, I just described this gel. And so when we say gel, we have a specific image in mind of what a gel is. Perhaps each of us have different uh, things that come to mind. Uh, but gels in this context are polymer networks that are surrounded by an aqueous environment. And so the, uh, in this case, it's the gel is a hydrogel it's surrounded by uh, a water-based environment. And so usually what ends up happening is we have this gel that's inside this uh, this box that has a, a buffer in it that's water-based that has different salts in it. And so for each gel, that, for, for the gels that we have, we'll add a protein sample, we'll add a protein sample at the top and it'll separate out into bands as we run this, uh, as we run our gel with our 100 to 200 volt uh, charge. Uh, oftentimes, uh, you can ask different grad students about this, the amount of uh, what, where you are in 100 to 200 volts depends on how fast you want to get done and if you need to do other things on top of that. Uh, but typically you run, you run the gel and it will separate out. So you don't typically see the proteins like this uh, when you're looking at a gel. Usually you're just seeing a gel and after you've run them, you're just, it looks like just a blank gel to you. It looks like almost as if uh, nothing has changed, but except uh, unless you've added some sort of buffer that, that adds like a, that's a, a bit of a staining buffer that helps you kind of see things run through. And so what ends up also happening is that these, these gels can also be stained. And so we'll talk about the staining in a, few, in a few slides, but what's important to remember is that there are several factors that are dictating our ability uh, to run this gel and separate out our proteins because of size and because of charge. So what we do is we try and eliminate one of those factors. And so in this case, using a technique called SDS page, uh, we can account for the charge and only separate them based on size. So the way this works is SDS page, it stands for sodium dodecyl sulfate. And I'll describe the rest of what page stands for. Uh, SDS, as it's termed, is, is uh, really important because what it does is it is a component in the buffer we use in, uh, in when we're loading our protein sample or in the aqueous environment that the gel is in. And it's an anionic buffer that bombards the pro every protein with a negative charge. And so what it does is it helps to denature the protein. So if we think about tertiary structure, we can remember that a lot of it has to deal with either ionic interactions or hydrophobic interactions. So what ends up happening is uh, this, uh, anionic detergent, it is, it, it's, uh, it's a bit like the phospholipids, it's aliphatic that we talked about a few lectures ago. Uh, it'll have a polar head with a long fatty acid chain. So what it's able to do is it's able to wedge itself in hydrophobic areas and open it up so that it becomes hydrophilic. So this protein that typically is folded up because of hydrophobic interactions, SDS will wedge itself in, 
And what ends up happening is we'll have one SDS molecule for at every two amino acids. So literally it is sticking itself in through everywhere in the protein and causing it to unfold and unfurl. And so because it's aliphatic, it has the, fat, it has the fatty acid chain, but it also has a negatively charged head. Uh, it's able to open up and create a, a really strong, a really large negative charge on this protein, regardless of what it was like before. So now with the factor, the, the main factors before being size and charge, we've now negated the factor of charge because now every protein has been, neg uh, has been bombarded with a negative charge now. And so what that does is it allows us to only focus on the size. But like I mentioned earlier, size kind of has like two sub factors. It's molecular weight and the degree of folding, okay? So this unfolds it, but this is only accounting for non-covalent bonds within the protein. Can anyone remember an example of a covalent bond that might alter uh, a protein structure? Yes. Uh, not quite. Yeah. Disulfide bonds. And so there, if you remember, uh, we showed an image of, because I'm sure you guys have recalled every slide I've shown, I showed a structure of insulin that showed that its structure and its ability to be bioactive is dependent on those disulfide bonds. And so SDS, while is great at unfolding it, uh, is not going to break disulfide bonds. And so we also add something called uh, beta mercaptoethanol. And it, uh, what, it, what it does is it's meant to reduce and break down the disulfide bonds. Uh, it's really important, but it also, unfortunately, it smells terrible. Uh, it smells like, as soon as you open the cap, it smells like you have a dead fish in front of you. But it's also, great. It's also really important at breaking down uh, the disulfide bonds. And so with SDS, that changes the charge and helps uh, denaturing to some degree, with the addition of also another reducing agent that addresses disulfide bonds. So now we've accounted for the degree of folding. So now they're all uh, largely linear proteins that all have the same charge. And so uh, it, that all have the same degree of charge. They have the same charge to mass rate. Because, I just, because if you imagine, there's gonna be different proteins of different sizes, different amino acid lengths, but SDS is wedged in one molecule at every two amino acids. So regardless of how big or small they are, they're gonna have the same amount of negative charge based on how frequently SDS is in that peptide sequence or, or amino acid sequence. And so charge is taken care of, degree of folding is taken care of. We also oftentimes will heat our samples as well as another way of denaturing them. And so there's just like redundancy upon a redundancy to try and make sure we've denatured them entirely. And now the last thing that differ, that is different, uh, the distinguishing feature for each protein now is just molecular weight. That's the only difference now between each protein in our sample. And so now we're able uh, to run them on uh, the kind of gel is a polyacrylamide gel here. And so, so on the next slide, I'll, I'll, talk, I'll talk about this a little bit more, but polyacrylamide is the kind of gel we use. And it is really easy to make, really cheap and really reliable. And so with a combination of all those things together, we are able to now separate our molecules or proteins according to their mass only, because both the degree of folding and their charge have been totally negated. Uh, are there any questions there so far? Yeah. Say it again, sorry. Uh, it's more so dependent on their, uh, to some degree that, but also how long, like how long that primary sequence is. Because not all proteins are gonna be the same length. And so what ends up happening is, but I think the, I'll stop it at this point, at that point, but there's a way to detect for specific proteins uh, that recognize uh, the specific amino acids in that primary sequence. But for today, we're just going to talk, we're, we're going to talk about saying techniques that just kind of look at total protein content. So that's, that's a good question. Are there any other questions? Yes. So, no, that's true. And so what I was trying to say is that it's both that, but also the, the length of the protein, because some proteins are going to be really short 
and some of them are going to be really long. So like, for example, we've talked about how there are some proteins, depending on their modifications, that can be three megadaltons versus some that are only uh, 40 kilodaltons. And so that's going to be, the, that's dictated by the modifications as well as the length of the protein. Does that make sense? So it's both. It's not just, it's not just the specific primary sequence. Are there any other questions? Yes. So when you've stained with specific, when you've stained with uh, these dyes that kind of look at total protein, you can see the separation because the gels are usually about like uh, like six inches uh, long. And so they're, it's pretty easy to tell that way. But then when we get to looking at specific proteins and using antibodies to measure them, uh, sometimes that degree of separation can be, uh, if you're trying to measure multiple things, so like some, there's a, there, uh, for people who've done West, for people who've done this, there's kind of a frustration where it's like, all of the proteins I want to look at are between 50 kilodaltons and 60 kilodaltons. And so it's just like, you know, you can't stain for multiple things at one time. And especially if you're looking at just like total protein stuff, you can't, you can't make any conclusions about specific proteins. And so the, the hope is that you run it the entire length of the gel so that you get as much separation as possible so that you can perhaps see that distinction. But if not, you use antibodies to measure those specific proteins. Yeah. So that, uh, so people, people use it for DNA. So we're not gonna touch on that today, but uh, typically people use it for DNA because you can actually see based on, uh, if you are using mice that have been genetically engineered, you can run a DNA gel to get a, to get a quick sense of, has the uh, DNA at that location been altered in some way? And so that's, you know, there's a, a, it's been called like genotyping mice to get a sense of, is, has their genotype been su successfully changed? And to do that, we run a DNA electro electrophoresis gel. And so, it, so that answers a, a very different specific question and for this, we're talking about specifically proteins that enables you to use antibodies or specific dyes to look at them. DNA gels use other, uh, other tools to try and assess changes there. Does that make sense? All right. And so the, the important thing here is I'm not asking you guys to memorize the structure. And so what I intent, what intent, and instead what I'm trying to do is trying to use this as a tool to illustrate SDS as well as the polyacrylamide gel that we're, that we're using for this. So SDS, like I said, is aliphatic. It has a long fatty acid chain with a negatively charged head. And acrylamide is uh, the main monomer, as you can, intent, you can uh, deduce from the name polyacrylamide, is acrylamide. Uh, but it's hard to just polymerize acrylamide by itself, you need something to help with the cross-linking. And so we use something called bisacrylamide. Uh, and so the way, that we, the way that we create this matrix of polyacrylamide gels is we use uh, free radical polymerization, and we use two things to create those free radicals, ammonium persulfate and TMED. And so this is the most widely used uh, gel system for, pro, for protein gel electrophoresis. For a long time, people would make their own gels. Now it's way more affordable to buy gels from a vendor and they'll actually create gels that have a gradient of concentration. So if you can imagine, if you increase the acrylamide concentration, you're making a more dense polyacrylamide network. And if it's denser, it's harder for large proteins to get through. So you can only have smaller proteins to get through. However, if you lower the concentration of, of acrylamide, you'll have, a less, you'll have a more porous network. So it's easier for large proteins to get through. So when people are making these, it's hard to make a gradient of concentration. So you usually try and make one or the other. Uh, you can try and make a gradient one, or you can buy one. That's what I've done. It's way easier. Um, but as you can imagine, uh, 
you know, when we think about how science was done for so long, you know, people used to mouth pipette, people used to not wear gloves very much, and acrylamide, we later found out, is a neurotoxin and really carcinogenic. And so over time, people develop acrylamide poisoning. And, you know, that made me thankful that I buy my polyacrylamide gels, but I also forgot that I still make polyacrylamide for other stuff. Um, but in addition to that, we all, unfortunately, I'm making uh, a, a base assumption about our, our everyone's dietary uh, intake, but we all have a, a, most likely consumed acrylamide in different ways. Um, what ends up happening is really starchy foods like potatoes, when fried to make French fries, uh, will often take the uh, uh, aspartame, uh, the aspartame amino acid and the malleard, the malleard reaction, which is often great for when you're cooking steak, great when you're making pork chops, for French fries will create acrylamide in the potato. And so when we're eating French fries, over time, we're, we're actually eating acrylamide. This is a really sad realization for me because I think French fries are delicious, but it's also something to keep in mind. Uh, sorry to bum you out on a Thursday like that. Go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, so there, there are lots of other ones, but acrylamide is, uh, I feel like this is oftentimes the unfortunate uh, explanation. It's really cheap to make and really easy to use. Um, and so polyacrylamide is totally safe. Handling the, the, the uh, polymerized gel, totally safe, not dangerous. It's when you're handling the monomer ac acrylamide that if you're not gloved and if you're not wearing proper PPE, you can over, long, over a long time uh, develop acrylamide poisoning. I am not trying to say that if we all continue to eat French fries that we are gonna get acrylamide poisoning, but rather to just keep it in mind and maybe we should not eat it constantly. That's just an idea. I'm also preaching to myself in that moment. Um, <laughs> so uh, yes, go ahead. Uh, I don't know off the top of my head. I'd have to look it up. Um, I, I don't know. I, uh, but I also recommend not going too, di uh, too deep into worrying about that. Uh, French fries in moderation. All good things in moderation. Um, so it's been asked a few times about staining and trying to detect proteins and looking at them. Um, so one of, the way, one of the most common ways to stain a gel when you're looking at just total protein content is using something called Kamasi Blue. Uh, that's actually a dye that's in our genes as well. And it, gives it, it helps with the blue tint. And so in this context, what it does is we're actually able to try, we're actually able uh, to look at the total protein content. But what's also important to note is that Kamasi Blue is also negatively charged. So what ends up having to happen is that you have to use a series of buffers to neutralize the negative charge on the proteins that we've induced because of SDS uh, uh, when running the gel. And you'll, uh, once you have your gel, you'll use a series of buffers to neutralize it, and then Kamasi Blue will be able to stain the uh, total protein there. Uh, there's also a way to stain for total phosphorylated proteins. And so as we've mentioned, as we've talked about a few times, uh, signaling events when, they're, uh, when a protein is turned on, uh, that's oftentimes a phosphorylation event. And so there's oftentimes an interest to try and look at the phosphorylation of specific proteins or total proteins. And so Pro-Q Diamond and FosTag are ways to measure specific or to, uh, total general phosphorylated proteins. So before I move on, yes, go ahead. So the, the point was because we wanted to provide a negative charge so that it could run through the gel because we have the, po the, the positive terminal on these gel, the positive terminal is at the bottom and we want it to run down. Yes, it's at the end. It's, so like after we run the gel, after we've taken it out of the whole system, now we just have a gel in a dish. Uh, 
And so now we want to try and be able, if, if your desire is to look at just total protein, uh, what you need to do is use a series of buffers now to neutralize the charge. And now you can use Kamasi blue to stain total protein. Does that make sense now? Great. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, so one thing I forgot to mention, forgive me. Oftentimes when we're doing gel electrophoresis, we will have a uh, standard or a ladder that is also run in the, first, in the first lane. And so this is your standard or your ladder. It has specific proteins that have specific molecular weights. And so you're not gonna have just like a huge uh, band like this. That's, you know, if we took a bunch of immune cells and burst them open, and ran them on a gel, uh, you'd get a huge smear like this. You get a bunch of different proteins everywhere. For the standard, they have a specific protein that's at this molecular weight, a specific protein that's at that molecular weight, and so on and so forth. And so you can say like, okay, this is 30, and you have uh, kind of like a, a key that says, this is 30 kilodaltons, this is 50 kilodaltons, and 75, 90, 100, so on and so forth. And so, and so what we're seeing here is this is total protein, from another stain that works similarly to Kamasi blue that just looks at total protein. Over here, we're, trying, we're seeing, uh, these are different samples, not the same samples. Uh, this is a proprietary uh, stain that looks at only phosphorylated protein. And so we're seeing that these bands, or there's a protein that's phosphorylated. Now, for the work that's being done typically, a lot of times in cell signaling papers or in research articles, you're not gonna see gels that have been stained like this. Instead, you're gonna see what's called, what, you're gonna see instead what's called Western blotting where we look at specific proteins that have either been phosphorylated or not. And so, but these are, this is just meant to help show how phosphorylated pro, total proteins look like and just generic total proteins there. Are there any other questions? Yes. Yes, those are, the, those are the names of the dyes, yes. And so typically, whenever someone is running a gel, they'll say M for like marker, and that's either like your standard or your ladder. And then usually there's better labeling than one, two, three, like you'll have your sample or whatever, treatment, non-treatment, control, positive or negative. Uh, but that's, that's typically the orientation left to right with your standard and your samples to, uh, beyond that. Okay, so. This describes, SDS page describes how we can separate these proteins based simply on their molecular weight. Now, if we wanted to look at separating them based on their charge, there's a way to do that. Uh, as we described beforehand in, uh, in an earlier lecture, each protein has a specific isoelectric point that is the pH at which these proteins are uh, electrostatically neutral. Uh, I think the phrase we use is the Goldilocks zone. It's the, it's the pH at which they are, they are the most happy and stable. And so what ends up happening is, if you can imagine a positively charged protein, if it's in this capillary tube, if it's at the positive end and if it's a positively charged protein, what's gonna happen? Is it gonna wanna stay there or move? It's positive in a positive area. So what's gonna happen? It's gonna move. And so it's gonna slide over. And this is a gradient of pHs. And so now it's moved over to the far negative end, but now it's lost a lot of the hydrogen, uh, hydrogen ions that are, were on it, it's become negative. And now it's negative in a negatively charged area. So what's gonna happen? It's gonna move back. And so it is gonna work, it's gonna move in this gradient of pHs to find its happy zone. Um, it's, so, so once it finds its, ha its uh, happy zone, its isoelectric point, the pH at which it's neutral, it will stay there. And so this is how we can run a gel that has a gradient of pHs uh, with, a, a, a really, uh, with a slow uh, electric current that helps it move and find its isoelectric point. And so, its happy isoelectric point. And so this method is called isoelectric focusing. And so you have a gradient of pHs in a gel, 
and the protein sample is in uh, an electric field that's been applied. And so what's really important is that the ability for this protein to move because of the different pHs and subsequent charges, it's a nice and slow process that allows these proteins to find their point. And they'll migrate until they're no longer charged and electrostatically stable at their isoelectric point. And so what oftentimes happens is that these protein samples, when they're run through this, uh, when they're run using the isoelectric focusing technique, they will uh, create these narrow focus bands at their specific pHs uh, that they're electrostatically neutral at. And again, the pH that they rest at when doing this technique is its isoelectric point. Are there any questions there before I move on? Yes. So that in that previous example, let me go back. So in this case, if this were a protein whose isoelectric point is over here, what ends up happening is it is uh, it, it takes on more hydrogen ions and it becomes more positively charged than it is when it's when it's uh, in an electrostatically neutral environment. So what ends up happening is it takes on more hydrogen ions and becomes more positively charged because this is a this is acidic pH three environment. So there's it's a, a, a hydrogen rich environment, and so it takes on more hydrogen ions, and it, that that excess positive charge will repel this positive will repel it from this positive end as it's running, and as it loses those hydrogen ions that it's taken on in this area here as it migrates over, what ends up happening is it finds a stable point. Where, it, where it's electrostatically neutral, it's isoelectric point. And so when running this gel, you know, you're, you're running a charge, all of a sudden at this point, it's neutral, it has no charge. So it will not want to move across the current that's here. Yes. That's a great question. Uh, unfortunately, it, unfortunately, we can't do that. So you know, we can. So typically, when doing protein biochemistry work, you can, again, like take the degree of folding out of the, take that variable out of the equation. But it's hard to. You can't really change the molecular weight of a protein, and so. Typically, this is going to be in the next slide. Typically, this technique, when used, uh, is followed up by is often used in parallel with what we were just describing with the SDS page. But I don't want to scoot myself, so I'm I'm just going to push pause on my answer to you for a moment. Uh, are there any questions? So, in, in the answer I was giving just a moment ago, I want to try and reiterate what I said there because I think uh, I, I think that might have been really important for you all to hear. So, there is. Uh, th there is an electric field here, okay? And as this protein is being run through, once it gets to a point where it's electrostatically neutral, where it has no charge, all of a sudden it's not gonna wanna move in this electric field anymore because now it is neutral. And so it, that's, it's gonna stay there and that point is its isoelectric point, all right? Now, as I was describing a moment ago, uh, you, you cannot, like we did earlier, you, it, you cannot, uh, take out the variable of size when it comes to the molecular weight of a protein. And so typically what happens is typically what happens is we are going to, uh, we're going to end up running a gel that tries to have the two variables of charge and mass together. This is called a two-dimensional electrophoresis. So what ends up happening is you will first run your isoelectric focusing gel uh, to separate them based on charge across this gradient of pHs. And then you will take that gel that has your protein separated and you'll put it on a polyacrylamide gel on top. And now you're gonna, now you're gonna separate them based on size here. So it's called two dimensional because in this X axis, they're separated by their charge uh, because of the pH gradient. And in the y-axis, it's separated based on size here. 
And so typically what that looks like is this. Um, we, you know, if uh, it, they, they no longer look like bands in this 2D page because they've been run laterally to create these bands and now they're being run vertically. Uh, and so you're gonna get these little, you're gonna get what looks like these dots that kind of have some dragging along them. And we'll talk about that in just a moment about why that's the case. Um, as I described before, uh, we, all, we will define the molecular weight of a protein by uh, kilodaltons. And so a Dalton is defined as uh, 1 the mass of a carbon-12 atom. And so 1 uh, and it's carbon-12, so that means one Dalton is one gram per mole. And we'll oftentimes define it in kilodaltons because that's a scale at which it makes, uh, it's the most easy to work with for proteins. And so that becomes the standard unit for uh, molecular weight for proteins. And we so I described a moment ago how we're accounting for charge in the uh, horizontal axis, accounting for size in the vertical axis. So what I wanna ask is, is it possible for there, for example, if we're looking at uh, number 22 at the top there, if we are looking at that spot, is it possible for more than one protein to be in that spot? How about this, agree or disagree? Could there, be, uh, uh, could there be more than one protein there? Yes, there could be. Now, next question is, uh, if we assume that that's one protein, is it possible for that same protein to be in different spots? I see a mixed bag. Does anyone want to uh, does anyone want to argue their case? Go ahead. I hear you. You make a strong case. Could changes be made to a protein? Or modifications. Does anyone want to argue for a case for modifications? That's, that's totally valid. And based on my experience, I have totally messed up my own samples and they look different than I want them to. There's actually a simpler, more simple answer for what something that can happen naturally that modifies a protein. Ahaba, you wanna give a shot? Yeah, that's exactly right. So if a protein is phosphorylated, um, it largely has the same mass, but its charge is different now, okay? And so for 22, there are, if you look closely, there's some series of dots to the left of it. For that protein, that's likely gonna be phosphorylated proteins uh, that have modified it and kind of created a bit of a tail to the left of it. And so it's possible for there to be proteins on these 2D, gel, uh, on these 2D gels uh, that are in more than one spot. It's usually not gonna be completely in a separate spot on the other side of the gel. Um, but in this case, it's uh, when we're thinking about proteins that are phosphorylated in a cell uh, or other modifications like sugars being added, glycosylated, they are going to create different spots on this gel uh, despite being the same protein. So I'm going to push stop there. Uh, we're going to pick this up next class, so we're going to talk about Western blotting and how we can detect specific proteins. Are there any questions about what we've covered so far? <clears throat>
Yes, I have it. When doing the 2D gel, it's it's two different steps. You run the isoelectric focusing experiment, and you have that uh, you have the gel where it's separated by pH, and then you lay and then next step you take that gel, lay it on top of a page gel, and run it that way. And so now you're separating by mass. Are there any other questions? All right, you guys have a good weekend. <laughs>